Hey, what is up guys? It's Stan here with another video. In this one, as promised, we're gonna be taking a look at the EVGA 3090 FTW3 GPU. And we're gonna be taking a look at how it performs on underwater with a water block, the overclocking potential, and then we'll talk about my general thoughts about the FTW3 version of this card versus something like the Founders Edition. So there's a lot to talk about, so let's get into it. Now behind me, you can see 3 Mark running. I'm just heating up the loop so that I can show you guys what the temperature is like once it gets to steady state. The 3090 FTW3 has been installed and actually it's been installed for the last several weeks now and I've been, I've been using it. So I've had a lot of time to dial in the overclocks and have uh, kind of wrap my head around how this card performs. But before we get into that, let's talk about the GPU water block install process. So what I did was I decided to go with the acetyl version of the EK block. Uh, this is primarily because I run with distilled water and I didn't really have any dyes or special coolant to show off. And the acetyl kind of covers up any, uh, you know, buildup or corrosion or whatever potential issues that I might have over the long term. So out of sight, out of mind. Now. The disassembly of the card is really straightforward. Um, uh, comparing the disassembling of this card versus the FE version, I'd actually say both cards are really easy to disassemble. Um, the FTW3 is probably a little teeny tiny bit easier for be just because there's less connections for the LEDs or the LEDs are, connections are all in the same place and they kind of pop off uh, relatively easily compared to the FE. That said, uh, disassembly, very straightforward. The longest part of the assembly for the water block is really the cutting up of the thermal pads. And because it's a 3090, you've got memory chips on the back side and the front side of the card. So you have double the amount of thermal pads that you need to cut and lay down. And what you'll see that there is a lot of thermal pads basically covering every, every major component on the card on the front and the back. So the EVGA backplate cannot be used with the EK water block. Uh, you have to purchase a backplate directly from EK. So that's what I did. I decided to go with the black backplate. Kind of matches well with the acetyl uh, water block. There's not much more to say about the install process. There's, there is a lot of screws and you have to be very meticulous about screwing everything down at the correct tension. Uh, one last note about the water block itself is that the end cap, uh, the FTW3, the white end cap, actually lights up Unicorn RGB. Um, and I found that that, to, that was a little bit too bright of an LG RGB compared to the rest of my system. So I actually ended up pulling the LED cable. So I just completely disabled. Right now, as you can see, I run without any RGB on the end cap of the GPU. I think it kind of, overwhelms all of the other RGB and the lighting in the system because there's no way to really tune that, turn that down, or at least I haven't found a way to turn that down. So it's kind of a disappointment that that end is unlit, but overall I think it's better that it's unlit than being too bright. Now a little bit more about this system. This system is not a gaming system as I've told you guys in the previous videos. This has a Threadripper CPU, a 24 core 3960X, so clearly not a gaming CPU, but I do do a, quite a bit of gaming on this computer uh, as well as video editing and whatnot. But um, so we'll keep that in mind. Now, as for cooling, I've got dual loops in the system, two 480 millimeters radiators on the top for the CPU and four, two 480 millimeter radiators for the GPU. So the CPU loop and the GPU loops are completely separate. Now, the GPU loop is pulling fresh air from the bottom, so it's gonna see the better temperatures of the two. Now keep that in mind, two 480 millimeter radiators is pretty extreme for cooling. Uh, this is probably gonna be a best case scenario for water cooling of this card. Um, if you use like a 240 millimeter radiator or even a 360 millimeter radiator, that's significantly less than what I've got here. Now, right out of the box, the card seems to boost very well. Uh, if you leave everything stock standard, 
uh, assuming that you push the power limit to 119% and temperature limit to maximum, but keeping core offset at zero and memory offset at zero, what you'll find is that the card will boost automatically to 1980 megahertz on the core and pull about 400 watts of total GPU power. These settings right here, this is just about what you can expect on a heavily overclocked 3090 FE card. You know, uh, on my FE 3090, even underwater, that card just managed right around 2000 megahertz. So this card right out of the box without even any additional overclock seems to be hitting those numbers already. The final overclocks I have settled in with is right around 180 megahertz offset on the core, which brings the total core speed up to about 2175 megahertz. Um, and then another 1000 megahertz offset on the memory. So uh, that is you know, another gigahertz on the memory. The final power draw of that card under those sustained loads is somewhere around 460 to 480 watts, depending on the scene, of course. The Time Spy Extreme scene number two seems to be very power hungry, and as a result, the cores drop down a little bit, you know, right around 2000 as, res as a result, but still pull in the 460, 480 watts of total graphics power. That said, temperature wise, uh, temperature wise is in the 40s, mid 40s. It never really gets up to 50 degrees. It's in the low 40s, 43 degrees at the moment, 44 degrees while the stress test is running in the background. Uh, of course, again, that is due to the extreme amount of radiator uh, volume that I've got in my system. So temperatures is not an issue. Now taking a look at what kind of performance do you actually get while having this kind of overclock on this card. So uh, on the left here, I've got a sc screenshot of Time Spy Extreme on the FTW3 Ultra. On the right is an FE edition card that's also underwater. Uh, you can see that the total clock frequencies is 2175 on the FTW3, while the FE only breached 1995. Also, however, the average overclock you can see is 2034 on the Ultra FTW3, while the average overclock uh, drops a little bit to 1846 on the FE edition card. Both cards are underwater, but it's really due to the unlimited or the unlocked power draw of the FTW3 and the power delivery, being able to pull that 480 watts of power to be able to push those clocks. And as a result, you get a total score of 11, uh, 11 on the FTW3, while you only get 10408 on the FE card. So that represents about a seven or 8% performance gain from the FE card to the FTW3. Clearly performance is there. You got seven additional percent of actual performance overclocked versus overclocked. Uh, that's actually a tangible amount of performance gain in my opinion, uh, especially when you're looking at both maximum capabilities of both cards. Uh, whether or not it's worth a $300 extra for going with the FTW3 Ultra versus a Founders Edition, and then of course the water blocks on top of that, but you know, water blocks on top of both, both are the same amount of cost. So uh, I think my two cents is get the card that you can get. Uh, it's, still, it's still 2021, there is still a shortage of cards. Uh, people seem to be able to be getting the EVGA FTW3s a little bit more easily than the FE edition cards. So if you can get your, your hand on the FTW3 Ultras, certainly there is a performance increase and certainly the um, the difference is tangible. Uh, if you can get your hands on the FE Edition card and you're deciding to go with Air, those cards are really nice, really quiet, um, and, and really well built. You know, the coolers look amazing. I know this is really not that helpful, but honestly, get the 3090 that you can get and just be happy with it because uh, both have their excellent selling points to, to why you would either go with the FE Edition or the FTW3. So hopefully this gives you a little bit of insight into what you can expect on a maximum overclocked uh, 3090 FEW3 Ultra underwater uh, in the most ideal scenarios. If you have any questions, 
uh, make sure to comment down below and perhaps I can run some custom tests for you guys if you want to know a little bit more uh, if you want to talk frame rates or whatever post those comments down below and uh, if you like this video you can hit that like button that'd be great and if you want to see more videos like this you can always subscribe as always let's see where you're using stand and I'll see you guys in the next one